So in soft partition clustering, we allow points to be assigned with some probability to certain clusters and uh, we do that by representing each cluster with a Gaussian. For simplicity, we consider isotropic Gaussians and can visualize the situation as follows. So let's assume we are just looking at 1D, and then this would be our data axis. We have data points, now drawn in green. Or one cluster. And in pink, another cluster. Another idea is that we assume that each cluster follows the Gaussian distribution. So then we would have a Gaussian here. And we would have, would have a Gaussian here. And this means it's very likely to find pink points here, and it's very likely to find green points here. And if we happen to have a point here somewhere in the middle, it's not very likely to find a point there, but if we have a point there, um, it cannot really be decided whether it belongs to the green cluster or to the pink cluster. So here we would say it's 50-50. While if we find a point here, it's also quite unlikely to have a point there, but if you have a point there, it's very likely that it belongs to the pink one and not to the green one. This is a standard formulation of a Gaussian. The dimensionality enters here. So this is a normalization factor, and this is just a Gaussian that, fall offs, that falls off with a Euclidean distance of the data points from the center. So we, for each Gaussian, we define a center that would be here for the green one and here for the pink one. Um, and the width is given by this standard deviation by which we divide. So this, this should be familiar. This is just a Gaussian. This gives us the probability of a data point given a cluster. So if we know we draw a point, we draw a sample from the green distribution, then the green Gaussian will give us the probability density function with which we will get the points. If we have another cluster, we have another Gaussian. Apart from a distribution for a given cluster, we also have a probability that a particular cluster is actually chosen. So in this case, I've drawn it such that there are approximately the same number of data points from the green distribution as for the pink distribution, but it could be that there are 10 more, 10 times more, uh, or 9 times more data points from the green distribution than from the pink distribution, and then the probability of the green distribution should be 0 0.9 and the probability of the pink distribution should be 0 0.1. So if we have that, then we can calculate the probability of finding a, a data point anywhere in space, uh, which is given as the probability um, of choosing a cluster times the probability of finding a data point at a particular location, given we know it comes from that cluster. And then we simply add over uh, the number of clusters. So this is standard Bayesian theory here. If we so this would give us the probability of one single data point. If we have several data points, we simply have to multiply these probabilities. right? So this is done here. So we multiply over the different 
data points. So xn indicates the different data points and n runs over all data points. So we simply multiply. And this gives us the probability of having a set of data points given our model, which consists of the Gaussians and the prior probabilities. Now this equation helps us if we have a model, right? But usually it's the other way around. Uh, we have the data points and we don't have the model. So we want to fit the model to the data points. And this is commonly done by maximum likelihood estimation. Mm. Okay, so we see that p of x depends on several parameters. In this case, that would be the probability for being in one cluster or the other cluster. So that's, if you just have two clusters, that would be one parameter because they have to add up to one. And for each cluster, we have the parameters of the Gaussian. Right? And the parameters here would be the standard deviation, if we assume isotropic Gaussians. So also isotropic means rotation symmetric, so it's the same in all directions. Yeah. So this would be a scalar parameter, and then we also have the center point, which is a vectorial parameter. Okay, so what we could do is we could extend this equation a little bit and write p of x sub n given our parameters theta. Well, it's not very nice to write this this way. Okay, so our parameters, let's call them, well, p is given capital A. Right, capital A is the set of all the parameters of our model. So if we have some data points, we can calculate the probability of the data points given the parameters of our model. Now, if the models are, if the model is not known, so if the parameters of the model are not known, we can guess them. And it's quite obvious that if we guess them well, then then the Gaussians will be placed at the right locations and will have the correct standard deviation. If you guess the parameters wrong, then we might have a situation more like this. Again in 1D, right? So we have our green data points and we have some pink data points. And well, one Gaussian could be here. And another Gaussian maybe could start here and go to sort of reach very far to the right. Then it's quite obvious that the probability of finding data points here in this area is very low. Right? It's the same data points, but our model is different. Right? So we have a, if you have a poor model that does not fit the data, then this will be a low value, while if the model fits well to the data, this will be a high value. Right? So thereby, by choosing the parameter such that this, that the probability of the data points given the model is large, gives us good parameters. Now this is an optimization with respect to the parameters and not with respect to the points, right? So therefore it's called maximum likelihood estimation and not maximum probability estimation. Because this function, considered as a function of A, is a likelihood, 
while the same function considered as a function of the data points would be a probability density. Yeah. So we want to estimate the parameters of the module model such that the data points as we have them become very probable. Yeah, and that's the, max, the idea of the maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, this is something you can calculate if you have the parameters. Right? You have the Gaussians here with the probabilities can calculate this thing. This is all analytically given, so we can take the derivative of this function, which is the same as this one, but here we haven't made explicit that there are model parameters. We can take the derivative of this function with respect to the model parameters and then simply maximize that. If you do that, and that's part of my ana the analytical exercises, we get the following conditions. So for the center vectors, uh, they should be placed at the sum over n p of k given xn times xn divided by sum of m p of k given xm. So, and the standard deviation squared would be given by 1 over d and then this expression and the probabilities would be given by this expression. Now let's go through these expressions and see whether they make sense. Okay, so what is this? Well, these are all data points weighted by the probability that cluster K is actually responsible for that data point. Now, so this is a weighted sum over the data points. And the weights are the probabilities of that cluster being responsible for that data point, right? This is a normalization, which equals the numerator if we ignore the data point, right? So this just serves as a normalization constant. So overall, this is a weighted sum over the data points, and the weights are the normalized probabilities of a cluster being responsible for a data point. So if I draw here, for instance, data points with thick points if the if they are likely to belong a cluster so for for large for large p of k given x and i draw data points somewhat smaller if they do not belong or if the cluster does not fit it is most likely not responsible for the data point right might get such a picture. Well, here yeah, outside, actually, the, the points should be very small. I can't, whoops, can't even draw them that small. Yeah. And if you now take the, the sum of all these data points weighted by the size, basically, because the size represents, um, represents this weighting factor, then you get a point that maybe lies here. Yeah. Mm, let's and that's pretty much just the center of gravity of the points for which that particular cluster is responsible. So that makes sense. Now, so what is this here? This is the squared standard deviation, so it's a variance basically, and again, it's pretty much the rule of the normal variance, so you take the squared distance of the data points from the center, weighted again with the same weighting factor as here, so weighted by how much, how, how probable it is that uh, cluster K is responsible for that point. So that is the standard way of calculating um, the variance. It is scaled by 1 over d, because where d is the dimension of the space. 
right? So if you have the total variance, so let's assume you have data which has variance 1 in all dimensions, right? Along the first axis, along the second and the third axis, if you're in three-dimensional space, then the um, total variance of that would be simply the sum over these individual variances, um, given that they're uncorrelated, would be 3, right? So it makes sense to divide by the number of dimensions in order to get the scalar value indicating sort of the, the radius of the Gaussian, if you like. Okay, so that also makes sense. And finally, we have the P of K, which is 1 over N, where N is the number of data points of P of K given Xn. So P of K given Xn is the probability that cluster K is responsible for that data point. And if we sum that up over all data points and be divided by the number of data points, so we take the average, that would be the probability with which we pick um, cluster number k. So all these rules make sense, and that looks like a great thing, right? So it looks like uh, it's very easy to calculate the center of gravity, um, well, the, the, the center vectors, the, the standard deviation, and the probability of the clusters. Now the trouble with this is that it that p of k is actually also included in these uh, in these equations on the right side. You can see this if you resolve p of k given x. Uh, you see that this is p of x given k times p k divided by p of x. And if you resolve this further, you get this equation. So we have p of k and p of l here in this equation. And while P of x given k is given, right? So that's what we have seen above here. So this is P of x given k, so that's given. But that also has, well, the trouble is, it also has these parameters, right? So the, the problem here is that through this P of k given x, uh, we have all the parameters also on the right side. Yeah? So this is not, uh, so we cannot calculate these three values in one step because all these three values enter also the right side. Oh, we see this also here clearly, right? So this is center here. Okay, so what one then does is one simply iterates these uh, these equations. And that then, that's then called the expectation maximization algorithm. Okay, so there are um, practical problems with this algorithm. So one is the typical get stuck in a local optimum problem. Um, so that's quite obvious that this can happen. Um, the way to deal with that is to start with several initial conditions, right? But there's another problem that's more specific to this algorithm, and that is that let me draw that oh let me draw this in two d so if you have a couple of data points two d Let's assume, assume it, you try to model this with two Gaussians. Then one Gaussian might focus on the overall distribution and the other Gaussian just focus on, focuses on one single data point, right? And it's sort of infinitely high and very, very localized around that data point. Now this makes the probability density of that point at that location go to infinity, right? So you get a very, very large probability of the data points given the model just before because one Gaussian zooms into this just one data point. 
So somehow you have to take care that this doesn't happen by, for instance, taking care that uh, Gaussian is responsible for a minimum number of data points or if the standard deviation goes down to zero, then you just discard this trial. So, so that's a problem. That cannot happen if you just fit one Gaussian because that cannot zoom on one data point because then the others don't get any probability. Uh, but as soon as you have two Gaussians, that can happen. Uh, and in general, again, you have the problem that the number of clusters is not determined. Okay, so this is the this was the version for for um, isotropic Gaussians, so rotation symmetric Gaussians. There's an unisotropic Gaussian version where the Gaussian becomes a bit more complicated, rather than just dividing here by the standard deviation as we have done above. So here we have divided by the standard deviation squared. We now have a full covariance matrix. Um, I don't go into details here. That should be familiar from principal component analysis that the covariance matrix can represent sort of a distribution uh, of data in n-dimensional space and this is the way to write this for Gaussian. The equations that we get look similar to those above. Actually these two are identical, just the estimation of the covariance matrix uh, differs from the estimation of the standard deviation above. But this is a standard covariance um, matrix here, now averaged um, over all data points according to the probability that the clusters are responsible for these data points. So it goes through, it works just the same as for the isotropic Gaussian, just the equations become a bit more complicated. Okay, I've just mentioned the practical problems that uh, that are connected to this algorithm look, get stuck in local optima uh, Gaussian might zoom into one data point and the third one being the number of clusters is not determined so what can we do about the last problem for hard partitional clustering we have learned that the davis bolden index can indicate or tell you maybe how appropriate the number of clusters is and um, for the soft partition clustering one can come up with a similar measure which is called here partition coefficient index. So the idea is now that in particular if you have anisotropic Gaussians, so could be very elong elongated or something, uh, maybe the dispersion is not the right thing, in particular also because you don't have a unique assignment of the points to one cluster. In soft partition clustering the points are assigned with probabilities to the to the um, clusters and if it, the clusters are well separated you can expect that the values so the probabilities with which points are assigned to clusters are either close to zero or close to one so there would be very few 50-50 situations maybe I can also visualize that Okay, so if the clusters, draw this up here. So if the clusters are well separated, so the, the Gaussians are far apart relative to their width, then it rarely happens that a data point sort of doesn't know exactly to which cluster it belongs. So here you would expect that the probability of k given a data point, so that is either 
so for this one it would be one for the green cluster and um, zero for the pink clusters and here it would be the other way around while if you have more situation as drawn above here we actually have points that are 50 50 right so they exist right it, I mean even in the mm, even here there are locations where the assignment oops even here there are locations where the assignment would be 50 50 but there are just no data points right okay so in a good clustering you would assume that p of k given xn is close to 1 or 0 Okay, so here a few things that we know from probability theory, of course, the probabilities are between 0 and 1. The sum over all k is 1 because it's normalized. From that follows, if you sum over k as well as n, you get n. And um, what does this mean? Well, if we sum over n, p of k over n, that should be greater than 0, since each cluster should contain at least one point, right? k cannot be 0 for all data points. The partition coefficient index now is defined as follows. So we take the square sum over p of x given xn and we sum over k and n. We divide by n. Uh, okay. Um, now what happens here? If p of k given xn is only, it only takes the value values 0 and 1. That means the assignment is unique to, to a cluster. That's the situation that we would like to have. If this is 0 or 1, then the squaring doesn't change anything and the sum according to this would be just n and if you divide by n we get 1. So this would be 1 if the assignment is unique. Now the worst case is that the assignment is always completely arbitrary or random or equal across the clusters. If p of k given xn is uniform because of this thing p of k given xn should be 1 over capital K Squaring would be 1 over k squared. Oh no. And then we sum over k and sum over n. Because we sum over k, we get rid of 1, 1 over k, but we are left with an, the other 1 over k, and this n cancels out with this 1 over n. So let me write this down. So we would have sum 1 over capital K squared and we sum over K and N. Yeah. So this obviously is K times N times 1 over k to the power of 2 and since in, in the sum we have this 1 over n in front 1 over n in front times the sum so we also have here 1 over n And that obviously is 1 over k because this 1 over n cancels with this n 
this k cancels with one over the one of one over k's, and then we are left with one one over k. Good. So that's the worst case, and the best case would be to have a value of one. Okay, so here starts agglomerative clustering. So if we have this index, we can do a similar thing as we did above. Right? As we did here with the Davis Bolden index. So we can use different numbers of clusters, run the algorithm a couple of times for each of these numbers to get the best fit, and then plot this graph and uh for the and if we have a value close to one, we know it's a nice clustering, and if it's a value close to one over k, it's not. <laughs>